Thank you, HMTCA. I'm really excited to have us all here in one space and really excited to be able to um, welcome our guest speaker who has volunteered his time to come and speak with us. Um, before we get started, please make sure that your cell phones are put away and they're on silence. Um, if you have a hoodie on, please make sure that um, you take it off your head. Um, and please make sure that you're being respectful of yourselves and representing um, HMTCA the way that we should be. Okay, um, so I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Maurice Humphrey. Uh, Mr. Maurice Humphrey is from New Britain, Connecticut, and he went to school in Berlin. He was a high honor student and an all-star standout football player. He got a full scholarship, a full football scholarship to Penn State, where he was a wide receiver and spent his next four years there. Currently, he has his own production company, Mo TV Network, and owns two nonprofits called $20 Challenge for Kids and Kids for Life. So we're really excited to have him here. If we can give him a warm round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Morgan that was awesome. That was awesome. Thank you guys. How you guys doing today? What, how, how are you guys doing today? I, I need the energy, you know? So, um, again, thank you guys for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm gonna just talk to you guys a little bit about uh, my story, okay? Um, growing up in New Britain, um, you know, you kind of go through a lot of different things, right? Um, being from the projects and really not having that much, um, sometimes you can get in trouble. So when I was eight years old, I ended up getting in trouble um, and going to juvenile detention, Hartford Detention. Um, yeah, so eight years old, you already know what I was doing. I was wild, okay? Um, so I was, at, I was in the Hartford Detention when I was eight years old, and then I ended up going to Lake Grove um, during that time frame. When I was 11, the captain of, my, of the police department in New Britain, Dennis Beatty, uh, actually saw my mother in a stop and shop. He asked her how I was doing. And my mom told him, you know, not that well. You know, he's kind of like not doing too well. So Coach Beatty took it upon himself to go up to Lake Grove and talk to my counselors. Granted, being I was on level four, he asked him if I would be able to come and play with my Pop Warner team. They said yes. The only thing would be that Coach Beatty would have to come and pick me up every day from New Britain, drive all the way to Durham, which is about 40 minutes or so, pick me up and then bring me back after practice. That's a huge obligation for someone, especially when they're the, uh, the uh, chief of police at, uh, in New Britain, but he agreed to do that. So um, he picked me up every day um, from Lake Grove in Durham and brought me to New Britain. At that point, I was able to kind of rekindle and reconnect with some of my old friends, um, and it was a great experience. My cousin, who never played football in his life, uh, decided to play as well that year, uh, just because, you know, I haven't, I had, I haven't seen him in, in three years. Um, what ends up happening at that point is, I meet a guy there uh, named John Capadice. And John Capadice was just one of the coaches there. Him and his dad ended up being a part of that, a part of that coaching staff. Um, he kind of took, took interest to me. You know, I was kind of one of those kids where, you know, there was something about me that he just thought that was different. So he would have, you know, some uh, conversations with me about, you know, you know, what am I doing right now? You know, what are my, what are my goals? All this, all this stuff. And I would tell him, you know, I want to play college football. I want to do this. I want to do that. Um, long story short, he asked Coach Beatty if it would be okay if he, if he would pick me up from Durham. He worked at, a, uh, at um, a place called Etna, which was literally five minutes from where my group home was. Coach Beatty said it was okay. They went to my group home and, and, and they worked all the details out. So at that point, John started picking me up every day. Um, on our car ride, we, again, we would just talk about a lot of different things and it was amazing. We go through the whole football season and um, we win states and then um, we go and we end up having a, uh, played the Danbury Vikings to kind of win everything to go on to the next step. 
we lose, right? Um, so at that point, I'm just thinking to myself, everything's done. I'm not at John's house anymore. It was to the point where I was, I was then getting furloughs every weekend going to my mom's house, and then I, I was going to John's house instead. Um, I couldn't read or write, so John would teach me every weekend that I was staying with him how to read and write. I would take 30 minutes a night or so, you know, start with a paragraph, you know, go with a page, and then, you know, after a long time, you know, I was reading, you know, you know a couple of chapters a, a night or whatever the case may be. Um, but he told me that, but he said, you know, I'm going to teach you this and we're going to do this and you're going to get rewarded for doing these things. Once we lost that game, again, I told myself and I thought in my mind, you know what? I got to go back to Lake Grove. I'm never going to see John again. I'm never, and I just got to go back here. You know, I'm probably going to be here until I'm 18 years old. When I'm in the car with John, I just start crying, you know, because I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm in Berlin, you know, living like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, you know, over there, and um, I got to go back to this, you know, situation that's not a great situation. John looked me in the eyes, and he asked me a question. He goes, if I was able to get you out of Lake Grove, would you want, to, want that to happen? I go, absolutely. He goes, but there's stimulations to this. There's rules to the situation. If I get you out of here, and I'm not telling you that I can, but if I can make this happen, you gotta make sure that, number one, academics is first. Because that's the most important thing. You gotta go to school and you're gonna be respectful. Number two, you can play sports, right? But if you're gonna play sports, you're gonna work hard at it. I said, I wanted to do whatever you want <laughs> if you can get me out of here. Two weeks later, he ended up getting me out of Lake Grove. So I moved in with him in Berlin, and um, I go to eighth grade McGee. Again, I'm at this point in this, in this town, Berlin, I'm, I'm one of four black people in my town. So um, I go into the situation, and it's, it's a little uncomfortable for me, you know, because I, I come from Pinnacle Eye Project, Mount Pleasant Projects. I lived in Hartford on Magnolia Street off of Albany Ave and Mazda. So me being, me being one of four black people in the town, when I'm so used to the, the, the opposite way around, was a little challenging for me. Uh, but I was able to adapt. Eighth grade was a great situation for me. Um, I'm playing AAU basketball, and um, I'm playing for a team called the Rising Stars. And we have this kid on my team, and it's one of my really good friends. His name is Roosevelt Lee. And in eighth grade, ninth grade, and in 10th grade, Roosevelt was actually rated above LeBron James. And uh, yeah, he was on my team, he's from New Britain. So in eighth grade, our AAU basketball team, we win states and we have an opportunity to go down to nationals, right? And um, I'm, I'm super excited. I'm like, we're gonna go down there, we get to play against some of the best. I get my report card. And one of the stimulations with John was, you get A's or B's, or you get no privileges, period. I get my report card, and I end up getting a 78 in uh, social studies. So you know what John did? You're not going to Florida. So I worked hard, very hard that basketball season to be a starter on that team, but also, you know, get an opportunity to go to Florida and play for a national championship. But being that I didn't, I didn't hold my end of the deal of getting A's and B's, and I only got a 78 in social, social studies, it wasn't good enough for him. What he told me was, as hard as you worked, playing basketball, shooting foul shots, running suicides, doing all this stuff, you could have worked a little bit harder in social studies to go from a 78 to an 80, and you would have had an opportunity to go to Florida. So, I mean, there was really nothing that I could do. I, I just didn't end up going. I told myself that would never happen again. You think, you think, you guys think that ever happened again? You guys think that ever happened again? It did. So, my freshman year in high school, I was playing for the Rising Stars again. We went to state, we had an opportunity to go down to Florida. <laughs> the funniest thing is my English teacher, Stan Brittingham, who played lacrosse at Penn State, um, who was a big influence uh, with me as far as going to Penn State as well. Um, I got a C in his class in English. I actually got a 79. And um, bring my report card to John. 
Got a 79. You're not going. From that point on, I never ever again got a 70 or a C in any class. I was on I was on, on honor road um, from pretty much that was that was my that was my the first semester of my freshman year. But from then on, I was always on the honor roll, A's and B's and everything. Because I, I never wanted to have that experience to be able to work that hard and then get something taken away from me, right? Um now the reason I talk about academics and the reason that John was so big on academics is because when I was at Berlin High School, I was a great athlete. I was all state, all American. Um, I had over a thousand points of basketball. I was the um, well, me and my one of my really good friends, Tim Washington. Um, we were uh, players of, players of the year um, in Connecticut in football. Uh, Timmy has like over ten thousand rushing yards. Like he's like ranked like third in the state of Connecticut or something like that. Um, he ended up going to Syracuse. Um, and the thing the thing that uh, John stressed so much about uh, the importance of um, of grades and making sure that you got A's and B's because I wasn't a great test taker, okay? One of the things that I that I was I did very well was if I was able to study something, I was able to get good grades. So the SAT was something that was very challenging for me. I wasn't even I didn't even get a high enough SAT to be eligible to go to college. The only reason I was actually eligible to go to college is because I had a high GPA. I think I had like a 3.8 or something like that GPA. So what ended up happening was I ended up going to Penn State and still getting a full scholarship to Penn State as a Prop 48. Now what a Prop 48 is, is means that you're still gonna be able to go to that school, still get your scholarship, but what happens is your first year you have to sit and get over a 2.7 GPA to be eligible for the next season. So that same season I got a 3.4 GPA, um, and then I was eligible to pretty much play the next year. Um, I go to Penn State and um, it's a great experience. I'm playing for Coach Joe, jo you guys ever heard of Coach Joe Paterno? So I, I played for Coach Joe Paterno and um, it, it, it was an amazing experience. Uh, Joe, Joe was the type of person who, um, you know, he saw my development from when I was in ninth grade because I would go to their camp every year. I would go to the Penn State football camp every year. And he seen my development from when I was a, a ninth grader all the way up to I was in 11th grade when they offered me my full scholarship. Um, when I was at Penn State, his wife, Sue Paterno, um, was my English tutor. So my first two years at Penn State, I would be at, Joe, at Joe's house twice a week, um, you know, getting tutored by his wife. Um, because the, again, the biggest thing with him was the importance of education. That was the biggest thing when it came to the Paterno family, the importance of education. One thing that I admired so much about Coach Paterno was he didn't care that I was good at football. Yeah, I played at Penn State and I started as a freshman when I was there and you know, I had to sit that first year, but that next year I ended up beating out a couple seniors and started my, that freshman year. Um, you know, and I was one of Coach Paterno's first freshmen to be able to play offense and defense. So the first four games, I played defense, defensive back, and they switched me over to offense. Um, so I played both ways, and I was one of the first players to do that. Um, but Joe didn't care that I was a good football player. His biggest thing was, I want to make sure that you're a great person in your second life, okay? What you do on a football field, field means nothing to me. Who you are as a father, who you are as a brother, who you are as a son in your second life is what matters to me, okay? So I'm at Penn State, and... I'm literally, you know, the last three games that I played at Penn State, you know, I was, um, you know, rated the number one receiver in the nation. Um, we played Ohio State. Ohio State had won the national championship in 02. Oh, we played them. They're 17 and 0 going into our game playing, playing us. And that's kind of like my first start, right? And, um, you know, I smoked them. Eight catches for like 87 yards. Um, we, we ended up playing Northwestern, smoked them too. 10 catches for like 110. Uh, then we played Indiana. I had like five catches for 125 and a touchdown. So during that time, I'm, I'm, I'm going this way. But mentally, I'm going this way because I have this humongous head where I feel like no one can tell me nothing. When you're, when you're, when you're an 18-year-old kid and you're playing in front of a, uh, let me ask you a question. How, how many people do you think fit in Penn State's football stadium? 100. 1,000? 30,000? 100,000. 
110,000. So there's 110,000 people that fit in Penn State football stadium, okay? Not to mention there's 60,000 students that go there. So imagine an 18 year old kid playing at Penn State in front of 110,000 people and pretty much you're the man. You're gonna get a big head, right? What ends up happening is I put myself in a, in a, in a position where I end up getting in trouble. The last game that I played at Penn State versus Indiana, Again, I have a great game, five catches, 125 and a touchdown. I'm partying it up, everything's great. I end up going out on Wednesday, uh, leading up the week, leading up to the Michigan State game, and I go to my workout hungover. Now, our, <laughs> our trainer, um, uh, Jeremy Scott, pretty much told me, get the out of here. I don't care, get out. So I'm like, all right, whatever, so I left. I go to squad meeting that day, that same day, and Joe literally is sitting at a podium. So he sits in front of the whole team every day just like this, and he looks me directly in the eyes, and he says, Maurice, you're kicked off the team. So for me, I, you know, I'm sitting there like, and the same way you guys reacted, all, the, all, my, all my teammates reacted that same way. The reason he said that was because even though I was 18 years old, there were other kids on my team that looked up to me. And I just worked, I wasn't doing the proper things. I was partying too much, you know, I was missing class. And I just thought that I, because I was playing football and I was being productive, that I could do what I want. And he put me in my place. Again, being 18, I took it a different way, right? So instead of, you know, humbling myself and just saying, you know what, I'm kicked off the team for this season, I'll take the L, come back next year. No, new slate. I party Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. <laughs> yeah. I, um, and then um, Saturday, we end up losing to Michigan State like 52 to like 7 or something like that. And then um, all the kids on my team come back, and I'm partying, right? And we're having a good time. I'm dating this girl at the time, and we were dating since my freshman year. And um, you know, at this point, we're having some problems or whatever because she's she sees that I'm acting crazy and doing wild stuff, and she's like, you need to calm down. And I'm like, I'm trying to live my best life, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so we were having issues. That Saturday, I'm hanging out, partying, and I do what I always do on a Saturday. Party, go back to her place. I go back to her place, open the door, walk in. It's her and another guy in the, in the room together. So... Yeah. At that point, at that, at that point, I have a decision to make at that point. Do I leave and just walk out the door or do I confront them? Me today would have just left. The young me at 18 years old, drunk at the time, being hurt that Coach Turner kicked me off the team and just not thinking, I approach the situation. And um, it's kind of crazy because even during that whole time, you know, from the walk from the frat house all the way up to Nittany Apartments, which is like maybe like a three mile walk, I run into like 15 of my uh, teammates on the way there. And they were trying to like get me to go hang out with them or get me to go somewhere else. And I'm just like, nah, I'm going over here. Now I'm going over here, I'm doing this. And I end up stopping at the library, which is kind of crazy. And at, back then, we didn't have Facebook or nothing like that. We had AIM, A-I-M. So <laughs> I checked my A-I-M, and I look at her A-I-M and her like emoji thing, and it's like a, like a heart smiley face. And I'm like, what the hell? What is that? So no, I end up going over there, and then I, I walk into that situation. So I approached them, and, you know, I knew who the kid was. You know, she ran track, he ran track, you know, and... You know, being 18, being drunk, and, and not really understanding, you know, no, this is this is not the end all. Me and the kid end up getting in a fight. So, in the midst of me and him getting into a fight, I beat him up pretty bad. Okay, so um, he gets a shatter, uh, shatters his, his jaw on both sides, a couple of different things, and I end up getting charged with with assault. And at that point, I feel like everything is ruined. I not only 
get kicked out of a football team, but I get kicked out of school because that happened on campus. And now I have to go to court, and now I have a trial to not get charged with aggravated assault, <laughs> where at that point I'm probably going to spend 10 to 15 years in prison. Because in Pennsylvania, it's common law, when you have that charge, even if the person doesn't want to press charges, the state can. So I just kind of felt at that moment, everything was falling apart. Um, I had support for my family, but not the support I needed. Um, so I, I just kind of had a decision to make. I go to trial, I end up beating the case or beating the situation, and they pretty much just said it was like a mutual fight. I walked into a situation and me and the kid got into a fight. So I didn't get charged with the aggravated assault. I got charged with a misdemeanor uh, mutual fight. Um, and then I have an opportunity to continue to go back to Penn State. I meet with the dean of students, I, I meet with Coach Paterno, I meet with Frank Ganner, Brian Norwood, the whole coaching staff, and um, I'm on probation at this time, and I have a decision to make. And they're saying, hey, you can stay here or you can transfer out. You, know, you have to make a decision. I'm like, I want to stay, you know? So I end up going to this branch campus, uh, Penn State Altoona, and I have to go there just for a semester. Go there for a semester, don't party, don't drink, don't get in trouble. And then you'll be, you'll be eligible to come back. You think I did that? Y'all think I know me? <laughs> so, yeah, I still party. <laughs> um, I go to class, but I don't go to class. And at this point, I had this guy named Michael Flanagan who, um, you know, he went to Penn State, he's an alumni, and he was someone that was kind of looking up for me. So during this point in my life, I have all the support. You know, Michael Flanagan has helped me out, got me an apartment, driving nice cars, babysitting these kids who are really small, getting paid crazy, and all I gotta do is just behave. But at that point, I'm just not in the right mindset to, to, to accomplish those things, right? So I end up meeting with the, um, with the dean of students, and she asked me a question. Sitting down with her, sitting down with, um, with Coach uh, Norwood and Coach Ganner, and she asked me a simple question. And the question was, since the incident that happened, have you drank? Now I'm looking at her, I'm looking at Coach Norwood, I'm looking at Frank Ganner. They know the truth, <laughs> because Coach Norwood had picked me up many times drunk or whatever the case may be. And Coach Norwood is a devout Christian. He's actually my son's godfather. And um, I can see him in his eyes and he's telling me, just tell the truth. Whatever happens, it's going to happen. Maybe it's not meant for you to play football anymore at Penn State. Maybe it's not meant for you to go to the NFL. Maybe you're meant to do something else. He's not verbally telling, it, telling me this, but I can see it in his eyes. So I told him. I told the uh, dealer students, yeah, I, I did. You know, I, a couple times hanging out with my friends, but I went home, had some drinks and stuff like that. So, after everything went through, um, I'm thinking, okay, I was truthful, I'll be back in school. I wasn't, late, I wasn't allowed to come back to school. Even though I was truthful, I wasn't allowed to come back. But like I said, playing football at Penn State or going to school at Penn State at that time might not have been what I needed to do. Going to the NFL at that time maybe was not what I needed to do. So what I ended up doing was, you know, I left Penn State. Um, but before all that happened, a crazy situation happened during that time too. Again, I was on probation. So right when I was pretty much getting ready to transfer out of Penn State, and probably I was in the probably going to either come, come back to UConn or I was going to go down play down level at Division II so I could play right away. Um, I ended up going to a bar, and I'm, you know, hanging out with people, and I got a fake ID. So I go to this bar, just like this, just regular me, right? I hand this this bar, this uh, bouncer, the, a fake ID. I don't know what my mind thought that this guy didn't know who I was. I give him the ID. He looks at it. He goes, are you, are you serious? This isn't you. I go, what do you mean? You're Maurice Sumphrey, bro. Like, I know you're in my class. Like, this isn't you. Get out of here. I'm like, all right. So I walked away. The guys whose idea it was went back to the bar to try to get it. Once the guy tried to go back to get his ID, they called the cops. 
I had already had a furlough that was saying that I was already in Connecticut to visit my family that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I had to stay that Friday because I had to switch cars in which to play in the game because uh, he didn't want me to drive his Mercedes out to Connecticut. I had to get a different car. Um, but I was still in, 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 in State College on that Friday. When the cops came to the bar and asked who tried to get in, the guy said me. So they alerted my parole and probation. That Saturday, they asked me, where are you? I go, I'm in Connecticut. Where are you at? Were you, in Penn Were you here on Friday? I go, I'm in Connecticut. They go, okay, no problem. Someone said you tried to get into a bar. We know you have to further to go to Connecticut, to go to Connecticut. No problem. When I come back that Sunday, my, my, my lawyer calls me and he goes, you need to be 100% truthful if you were at that bar. Because if you don't, and they do find out, you're gonna be in serious trouble. I said, okay, told my lawyer. I wasn't there, it's in Connecticut. So I'm talking about lawyer. Because the last time I was truthful, I, I wasn't able to go back to school, right? So in my mind, I'm thinking, guess I'm just gonna roll the dice. When I get back into State College, my um, Coach, Coach Norwood and Coach Larry Johnson ends up coming up to me. And they say, listen, we know you were here. You know why? Because Coach Johnson's son, Tony Johnson, ended up having, so his brother, Larry Johnson, um, played football at Penn State, rough for 2,000 yards, played with the Chiefs. Tony had Larry's Jacob watch. Back in the day, Jacob watches were like crazy. They're like $20,000 a watch. Tony had his brother's watch, and then I saw Tony that Friday night, and I had his watch. I was like, let me, let me, let me wear it. I wore it, Tony left, forgot about it, I had it that whole night. The next day, Tony had to come get the watch from me on Saturday. Then I left to Connecticut. The only reason that Tony, I mean, Tony didn't know that I, that I tried to get to a bar. His dad just asked him, did you see Maurice on Friday? He goes, yeah, he, I had to go get Larry's watch. That's how they knew. So when I came back on Sunday and they asked me the question, hey, we want to make sure that, you know, you're telling the truth. Because not only was Coach Brian Norwood, you know, Coach Larry Johnson Sr., Joe Paterno, Co Co you know, Coach Tom Bradley were going to pretty much put their names on the line for me, pretty much explain this to me like, you know, they're trying to, they're, they're trying to get you, you know? We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, put something in, in, in the Pittsburgh paper. We're gonna go to the New York Times. We're gonna just make this this big thing because the probation office is trying to put you in jail. Only so and again, they asked me, "Are you sure? Were you not at this bar?" At this point, I'm sitting down with all these coaches and I'm looking at them, and I have to make a decision. Again, do I be truthful or do I lie? These guys are really about to put their name and reputation on me for a stupid mistake that I made. So I told them, yes, I did. I had to go to out of uh, probation and explain to them exactly too. I did try to get to the bar. Um, you know, I'm accepting whatever consequences you guys give me. So the consequence was, we're not reinstating your probation, you're going to jail. So they ended up sending me to jail um, for eight months. So during that time frame, I was not able to transfer. Um, then I had, I had to go to jail for eight months. I ended up going to jail and um, had to make a decision whether or not I wanted to um, continue to play football. Um, I couldn't go Division One. I, I couldn't go to 1AA. I only played Division Two at this point based upon the, um, being an athlete, you have to have, you have to be on, 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 a, on, a, on a, pretty much like a, on the clock. Um, so playing Division II is by semester, so that's the only place that I can go play Division II football. Once some schools found out that I was willing to go down and play Division II, I had about 25 schools come to the jail and interview me to come play at their school, which was weird. Like I'm sitting there in my orange jumpsuit and the coach is telling me, I want you to come play for me. Um, so again, I ended up going to uh, a school called Kutztown University, it's in Pennsylvania, and um, you know, I had to sit the first, the first semester again. And um, at that point, football didn't mean that much to me. You know, um, just kind of said to myself, you know, I'm still partying, I'm still hanging out. You know, I'm um, not really interested in football. So 
When most people are done with sports, what do they really say they want to be next? I want to be a rapper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I know, I know. I want to be a rapper. <laughs> I said, uh, I'm going to do whatever I can to get in the game. At this point, I told myself, there's a lot of my, my boys I played with at Penn State that are in the league right now. My boy Tama Ali, um, my boy Larry Johnson, Jimmy, a bunch of my boys are in the NFL. These guys will be able to help me because they got million dollar contracts. So they'll be able to give me a little bit of money to push this music career. That didn't happen. <laughs> uh, I had to do it myself, right? So I had to grind for it. Started doing music, and the crazy thing about it was when I was at Kutztown, Michael Slaney was actually helping me with my rent and everything at Kutztown. So I had one of my one of my one of my best friends now, Alfred Keyless. He ended up transferring down to Kutztown uh, with me, and uh, I ended up meeting this kid there who was a freshman and um, talented kid. His name is uh, uh, his name's Tyler Dennis, right? He kind of doesn't, you know, he's, he doesn't have much. So I say to him, hey, look, you know what? Stay with me. Let's get a futon, sleep on a futon. So for two years, he stayed with me, you know, in, in, in my uh, condo. Um, great kid. He did music too, you know, all this stuff. Played football. And we became really good friends. Once I left Kutztown and ended up coming back to Connecticut, Ty got into some trouble. And, um, Got into a fight and beat this kid up. Sound familiar? So, Ty does like three months in jail or so. When he gets out, calls me, says, Mo, look, I wanna be a rapper, man. I, I wanna do this music stuff. You know, what, what do I gotta do? I literally say to him, Ty, look, you're too light skinned. You can't be a rapper. You gotta, like, do something else, bro. Like, act, do something like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you're not built for that. So he said to me, he goes, okay, cool. Our other friend, Leroy, was living in San Diego going boxing for the Mayweather camp. He goes, yeah, I can go out to, to San Diego and maybe have an opportunity. I go, no problem. So I helped him out with a little bit of paper. He got a flight, went to San Diego. He was working at Manibu Fitness, and um, he got approached by this girl. And this girl said, oh, you have a great look. I would love to get you into this indie film. Tyler goes, okay. He ends up being in like these two horror indie films and um, ends up getting recognized by Tyler Perry. At that moment, he goes from getting into a fight, want to be a rapper, getting help, going to San Diego, being in two indie films, being at the right place at the right time, and then being on the have to have nights, have and have not for seven years. I say Tyler Dennis, but his real name is Tyler, his, his, his actual acting name is Tyler Leffler. So he was on the Have and Have Not for seven years. He's on the show right now, Pea Valley. He's on the show Harlem, that's on HBO. Um, and he's doing great, you know. Got an opportunity, and he did a great job. Once that whole situation was over, I was still doing music, doing events and doing everything, and it was great. Doing shows for Drake, Omarion, Red Man and Meth Man, Buster Rhymes, you name it, we were doing it, right? Um, at that moment, you know, I kind of had to make another decision. This music thing that I'm doing, it's not really panning out the way I think it's supposed to pan out. I don't have kids at this time either, but I have to make a decision. You know, do I continue to do this music stuff and do these events, or do I just start working? <laughs> Do I just say, you know what, let me put my, you know, go back to school, you know, put a degree to work or just get a job? I decided I just needed to get a job. So I got a job working at this place called Sleepy's. Um, it matches from now, but it was Sleepy's back, back when I started. Um, and it was great. I ended up going in right away, being a store manager, making really good money. Um, ended up having my daughter. And everything changed at that moment. When I had my daughter, everything changed. I wasn't drinking, I wasn't partying, I wasn't doing anything. It was all about my daughter at, that, at this moment, right? 
Um, my daughter is seven now, I'm gonna be eight. And um, recently, again, I just had my son, age three. And um, around the time he was born, a friend of mine, back when I was partying and doing all this crazy stuff, sent me a message on Facebook. And this was right when the pandemic was happening, right? And she said, well, I'm down now. I don't know what to do. I got five kids. My, 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 my kid's father's not helping me. Is there any way you can help me out with some money? Back in the day, again, she was a bartender at a strip club. I'll be at the strip club, you know, throwing it up, whatever. <laughs> the same. And, um, you know, she, she hit me up and she said, hey, can you help me? Usually I'd, I'd be the guy to do that, right? But I said, listen, I can't do that. But what I can do is this. I'll put something on my Facebook account and I'll say a $20 challenge. A friend of mine needs help. Does anyone want to donate 20 bucks to help me help her get some food for her, for her kids? When I made that post, that same day I got $700. Just from my friends on Facebook, right? From that day on, I just kept posting it. Kept po every day I kept posting it, $20 challenge, $20 challenge. For the next two years or so, we were, we were, we were getting donated in five to $7,000 every month. So we were helping about 120 to 125 uh, families every month for about two years. Um, started this thing called uh, uh, Kids for Life, where we were just doing free events for kids. Um, one of the events that we do, we just ended up doing one at Safari Golf, where we had 400 kids come, play mini golf for free, free food, everything was great. We did a PS5 raffle, it was a great time. One of the things that we're doing this year is that we're taking four kids up to Penn State to have this Penn State experience, where you can go up to Penn State, if you play a sport, you can meet the coach of that particular sport you play with. So you play football, you get to meet Coach James Franklin. You get to meet some of the players, right? You play soccer, you get to meet the coach. Wrestle, you get to meet the coach, right? You also get a tour of the campus, okay? Hey, even if you don't play sports, and you want to come to Penn State, and you're, and you're eligible to go, and, and again, when I talk with you about it, you know, we'll figure out who, who's, gonna, who's gonna win those prizes, you don't have to be an athlete to be able to come up to Penn State. But think about this, you can be an athlete, but you, but you might not be academically ready to go to Penn State, okay? If you're a student, you can still have the opportunity to go up to Penn State and get that experience. Everything is free. So we leave on Friday, we got a house rented out, we go to the game on, on, on Saturday, um, you, get the, you know, get the experience of the football field, you get, you get the experience of tailgating, all that stuff. Um, so again, that's one of the things that we do to give back. Um, now at this point, I have this uh, uh, company that I, that I started called MoTV Network where, again, like I'm doing now, talking to you guys about certain things and just my life story. We have a couple podcasts, we do short films, we do feature films. Um, and I have this podcast that we're starting out called Stories of an Athlete, um, where we have a bunch of athletes that are gonna be on this podcast, a bunch of boxers, um, football players, basketball players, uh, trainers, everything. Um, and it's a great situation. Uh, we're also gonna be having uh, some of these guys actually come um, and talk to, talk to the kids. Unfortunately, I was gonna be able to have um, um, Tony Harrison, who is um, the junior middleweight boxing champion, champion of the world. He was supposed to come today. Couldn't come for, some, for, for a reason, he had some things going on. Um, but the next time I speak, and if I get an opportunity to come back and speak, I'll have one of those guys come up and speak as well. Um, but again, you know, one thing that I always say is opportunity is given to those who want to work hard, right? When I moved in with John Capadice and I told him I want to be the best player in the state, he said, you know what it takes to be that? I go, I have no clue. He goes, you got to be the first. So whatever you do, you gotta feel like you gotta be the first. So I told myself, you know what? I'm gonna be the first person to wake up in the state of Connecticut before anybody else in the state was up. I'm gonna be up running. I'm gonna be up at my high school working out. So at 4 a.m., when my boy Tim Washington, or my boy Justice Harrison, these guys that went and played D1 ball, when they were in their bed still asleep, I was up working out. I wanted to be the first. And it proved. I ended up being you know, one of the best players in the state. Um, as well. Um, 
So again, like I said, you know, one thing that Coach Paterno always said, and again, guys, I, 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 I'll end it with this, I don't know what, how much time we have, um, is success with honor. That's one of the biggest things he said, success with honor, okay? Um, guys, I appreciate you guys having me. I want to open it up to maybe some questions. I don't know if you guys have got ten, about 10 minutes left. Um, I want to open up some, some questions. So if any of you guys have any questions about anything, raise your hand, and then I'll... It's a good question. She said, why, do I, why did I feel the need to feel so rebellious? I'll tell you this. Growing up, okay, growing up, I didn't, have, I didn't have my father around, right? I never met him, right? Had my mother, had my sisters, had my grandfather, stuff like that, but I never had a male figure in my life. Not until I met John Kaplan's, right? So during that time frame when I was a kid, I just was rebellious. I just kind of... I didn't have any rules. So I was always out at Washington Park till 11 o'clock at night in New Britain hanging out with, with, with you know, the gang members and stuff like that, you know? I, you know, when I was, you know, living in Hartford, you know, I was on my and in Magnolia and Albany at 11. You know, as a kid, um, just being rebellious. When I had the structure in John's house, I wasn't as rebellious. I had structure. So, Having that structure, you know, be, I had to be in bed by 9.30. I had 30 minutes to be able to call someone on the phone, whether it was my girlfriend at the time, one of my friends. From 9 to 9.30, I had time to either watch TV or be on the phone, okay? Um, you know, and that was every day. You know, I had structure. Having that structure at Berlin was great. I didn't party. I didn't drink. I didn't do anything. It was school. It was football. It was sports. When I went to Penn State, <laughs> it was like I was released, okay? So when you're an 18-year-old kid and you go to a school like Penn State with 60,000 students, you never partied before really, you never really drank, you never did anything, and now you get put in that situation, you're gonna rebel, you're gonna just go crazy. So that's what ended up happening. I, I ended up going to Penn State, and even though my coaches were there, there's only so much structure a coach can give you. You gotta still have that discipline to be able to continue to do it yourself. At that point, I really didn't have that much discipline. So, yeah, I was going out at night and partying, and I was doing those things. Um, it wasn't until I had my kids where I kind of told myself, yeah, things need to change because it's not about me anymore. Remember, guys, I said before that one of the things that Cole Paterno told me from day one, I don't care how good of a football player you are. I care about how good you are in your second life. So when I had my kids, to me it felt like that was my second life. I felt like, you know what? I gotta be a role model for them. I gotta tell my story, whether it's to you guys or to whoever. I got to show my son, you know, you gotta be respectful, you know? You know, I gotta be the role model there for, you know, for my daughter, you know? You know, my, my son and my daughter, have, they, they have two different mothers, but my, 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 my son's mother and my daughter's mother are like best friends. Like, they text each other on the phone, call them, like, that's weird. But, like, you know, you know, they're cool, and they make it about my son and my daughter, which is great. So to answer your question, I think the biggest thing of why I was so rebellious is that it, it, a lot of it is structure. When you have the structure in your life, you know, um, it's easier to do the right thing. When you don't have that structure, a little harder to do the wrong thing. What I try to say is that you got to find those mentors. When I was at John's house in Berlin, he was my mentor, he was my coach, but he also adopted me, but, you know, he, he wasn't my dad, but I saw him as dad. He gave me opportunity. If you do this right, you get this opportunity. If you do this situation, you get this opportunity, right? So, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but any other questions? I went to Ber Berlin High School. That's a good question. So he said, what high school did I go to? I said, Berlin High School. And he said, how did I get scouted to get a scholarship? So it's a little different now than what it was back then, OK? Now you have the huddle. You have all that stuff where they can see you on YouTube, and you can put your best plays up, all that stuff. We had to do it the hard way. 
I went to camp. So from ninth grade to you know 11th grade, you know, I went to the Penn State football camp where there's 500 kids competing for a scholarship, okay? Um, and they're only giving out one. So my freshman year and sophomore year, they're not giving scholarships to freshman and sophomore at that, at that time. But my freshman and sophomore year, I played varsity football as a freshman in, in my high school. I was the first freshman ever in my high school's history to, to play uh, varsity football. So when I went to Penn State's camp as a freshman and sophomore, I still played up at the camps with the juniors and seniors. Even though they were, they were trashing me the whole time I was there as a freshman and junior, it still made me better. I was able to be at these camps and see the difference. I thought, okay, I gotta be great in Connecticut. When I went to that camp, I'm like, who's this kid from Texas? Who's this kid from Miami? Who's this kid from New York, Jersey? I'm like, this is crazy. I gotta compete not only against the kids in Connecticut, but in the, in the country. I saw that right away. That's why when I said I needed to be the first person up, in my mind, I wasn't just competing against, you know, the kids in Connecticut or in my town or on my team, you know, or in the state. I'm competing against kids in the country. So that's why I even said to myself, it's not even about me being up at four o'clock, being the first in the state of Connecticut. I gotta be better than the kids in the country. So to answer your question as far as scholarship went, when I went to Penn State, going into my junior season, um, you know, they saw my tape, they saw all that stuff. Um, but the great thing about it was they were able to see me in person, okay? They seen the progress that I made from ninth grade all the way to my junior season, academically and football-wise. I got better in both aspects, right? So not only did Joan, the coaches that said, hey, you know what, he could probably play here, but you know what, he can do the work. Because that's what matters the most. Can you do the schoolwork? You could be the best athlete in the world. I'll give you an example, my boy Rose Lee, like I said, he was rated number one. He was rated above LeBron James and all that. But academically, he just, he couldn't do it academically. So he wasn't able to go to college and do these things, right? Um, so I would say that. I went to the camp, and um, at that point when I was at the camp, I just had to run the times. I had to run my 40, um, I had to run my shuttle, and I had to hit time. So yeah, I ran 437. Uh, when I went to camp, and um, when I ran a 437, it was like, here's a scholarship. Any other question? How old are you? That's, girl? <laughs> oh, so I'm, I'm, 30, I'm 38. So I went to high school in 02, born in 83, graduated, I mean, I didn't graduate, but I ended up graduating from, from Penn State Worldwide Campus. Um, and um, yeah, 30. Damn, is that? Y'all thought I was older? Or like, damn. It's the gray hairs, right? It's the gray. I think we have time for one more question. Tell me, got time for one more question, if anyone has one. Where? Yeah, I can hear you. So, that's a great question. No, no, I'm, I'm gonna answer. <laughs> my mother was my biggest fan, still to this day. To this day, I make a grilled cheese sandwich for my son. My mom is giving me praises. When that situation happened, when Coach B saw her in Stop and Shop and asked her the question, how's Mo's doing? She said, not good. Um, you know, he came up and he helped me. Without my mom, and what my, without my mom signing off or giving, you know, Coach, you no, know, John capitalized the permission and let me live with him and all this stuff, none of these things would have happened for me. And I wouldn't be in the position that I am right now, not only, you know, with my kids, financially, anything, um, without my mother. Okay? My mom, you know, wasn't there for me all the time when I was a kid, right? But um, she's the best grandmother I know, and that's what I appreciate the most about her. She loves my kids, loves her grandkids, loves her, you know, so, you know, that, that's what means the most to me. Um, my mom was always there. Even when I moved to Berlin, she was there. She would come visit, she lived in New Britain, right? Every football game, my whole family would be right at Sage Park cheering me on. Um, 
Even when I was at Penn State, and even when I was going through situations that I was going through, my mom was always there for support. So I definitely give, you know, you know I've talked about John Capitize, Coach Beattie, Coach Norwood, all these guys, Joe Paterno, uh, Michael Flaney, and all these guys that helped me. Um, yes, these are all, all, all men that were in my life at this time that helped me, because again, I never knew my dad. So these were guys that were, men, that were mentors to me that kind of helped push me along, you know, along the way. But again, without my mom, without my mom, giving Coach Beattie permission to pick me up or without that situation happening when Coach Beattie seeing her and stop the shop, none of this happens. I'm probably in juvenile detention in late group, group home, so I'm 18, and then who knows? So, yeah, my mom, my mom has always been there. She's been a great supporter. Um, you know, she's a great grandmother. You know, you know, she lives in South Carolina now, married. You know, it's, it's, it's the great situation. When I left to go to college, my mom left to South Carolina. She was not staying in New, in New Britain anymore. She wanted to change her life as well, um, which she did, you know. And, um, you know, I, I'm super, I'm super grateful for her. Um, but I'm also grateful for, the, for everyone that's, that's helped me in my life. So I'm not sure, does that, does that answer your question? Oh, never. She'll be, she been, she been reminding me since January. So it's like, yeah, that's not a problem. So um, guys, again, I, I, I wanna say thank you for having me. Um, had a great time, I hope. Some of you guys can take something from this. And um, again, thank you guys, appreciate it.